Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back here at the end of the week for another weekly market recap featuring my great friend, I'll upgrade him from good, Lance Roberts. Lance, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I like getting promotions. That's always a good thing. Adam, how are you? I'm doing, I'm doing okay. Been a bit of a rough week um, for those folks that have been tracking. My mother did pass away this past week. Um, it is very sad. There were a lot of elements of her passing that actually were fairly wonderful. If we get a chance near the end, um, I'll, sh I'll share a little bit because it might be instructive uh, for us to talk about, Lance. A lot of things I learned uh, under duress uh, over this past uh, couple of weeks that that may benefit from folks who also have uh, parents who are aging at this point in time. Um, but we'll get to that in a bit. Let's get to the current market action. Um, I want to ask, uh, mar markets are, are they're down a little bit ending the week than they were at the start of the week. Are, are we beginning to see some topping here or, or just a, the pause that refreshes? Well, uh, uh, unfortunately, we just don't know yet. Um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, to, so let, let's kind of step back for just a second. Uh, last week we were on the show. Uh, we talked about how the market was three standard deviations above moving averages, very overbought. We're due for a correction. And so we got a bit of that correction this week. We haven't triggered sell signals yet. So again, right now, the bull market is still very intact, even though the market did pull back a little bit during the week. What was interesting is, though, is, and this is simply a function of momentum and psychology and, and bullishness is really getting very bullish right now. If you take a look at the American Association of Individual Investors, if you take a look at the uh, institutional professional managers, all these, all and, and just basically look at asset allocations of managers and retail investors. It is basically everybody is now back in the equity pool. So they went from extremely bearish in October, and you and I were talking about how we had this extreme bearishness, which from a contrarian standpoint was a bullish indicator for the markets and suggested that markets would improve from that point, which obviously they have. Now we're back to extremely bullish, where everybody is only expecting markets to go up. Downside risk has been eliminated. Take a look at call options, which are now, you know, we have the highest level of call options on record. Nobody wants to own puts anymore. Um, and, and that's just that, that exuberance has now come back into the markets. And I thought it was very interesting this week. Um, Jerome Powell had testimony before both the House uh, uh, Banking Committee, House Financial Services Committee, and the Senate Banking Committee. And what was interesting is that he went literally out of his way to make sure and state that they are not done hiking rates yet and that inflation was not coming down as quickly as expected, unemployment was too low, and that more tightening was going to be needed in order to, to make sure that we don't get a resurgence of inflation down the road. Now, that, that information is not bullish for long duration stocks. And what do I mean by long duration stocks? Um, if I buy a stock where I am dependent upon future earnings to justify the current valuation, that requires a lot of time, right? The company has to grow in to those valuations. So that's a long duration stock. That requires stronger economic growth, lower rates of inflation, and, and, and basically low interest rates to help support the debt that goes underneath that growth. None of that is what the Fed's talking about, yet everybody's still chasing tech stocks. So uh, again, it's, it's, it's very interesting. The market is completely ignoring what the Fed is saying. In fact, the market, the, the Fed said, we're going to hike two more times. And the market said, no, I think it's just once. <laughs> you know, it's like, you've got Fed speaker after Fed speaker coming out saying, we are going to hike more. And the market's like, I don't believe you. So, you know, nonetheless, the market's arrived. A lot of this momentum, a lot of this is end of the quarter positioning. Don't forget that next week is the last week of the second quarter. Right, um, right after the 4th of July, we're going to kick off earnings season already. I mean, we just went through earnings season. Now we're going to have it all over again. So millennial earnings season coming back. Everybody's going to get a trophy because we've been cutting estimates again. Um, but this is this this next week, we could see this market kind of travel all over the place. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see a little bit more of a sell-off in the markets next week because if if you just think about a lot of portfolio managers, so uh, you know pension funds, mutual funds, um, portfolio managers, anybody that runs any type of, of balanced allocation. So if they run uh, you know 80, 20 stocks to bonds, 60, 40, 70, 30, 30, 70, whatever it is, whatever that mix is, they're now overweight 
equity because equity has gone up. Bonds really haven't gone anywhere this year. So what that will they will have to do is they will have to sell some equity in order to buy fixed income. So that's just going to be that rebalancing that's going to occur at the end of those quarters. So that may put a little bit of additional pressure on equities uh, going into next week. I don't know. Um, but that's one one potential catalyst out there. And but again, there's just a lot of momentum behind the markets right now. There is a lot of people that all of a sudden woke up out of this slumber from last year and go, oh, crap, I got to get into the market. And, you know, there was a lot of money sitting there that needed to go into equities. And we've seen professional managers, just like everybody else, chasing stocks, because when those quarterly reports go out at the end of next week, they better own NVIDIA and Apple and Microsoft and Amazon. Well, right. they better own those stocks. Even they may buy, they may buy NVIDIA on the last day of the month, but it'll be on that statement when it goes out for the quarter. And then that way, when people read their statements, they go, oh, look, my, my mutual fund manager, he's a genius. He owns NVIDIA. You know, he may have just bought it, but it'll be on the, it'll be in the quarterly report. Okay. All right. Um, you mentioned a couple of interesting things there, one of which you were remarking at how the market just is totally ignoring, you know, what the Fed's yeah. been saying. That's been the case for the past six months more. Yeah. Right. I yep. mean, and what's interesting is the market has always been the one that's been forced to move its goalposts, but it hasn't mattered in terms of valuations in the market. Exactly. <laughs> the market, oh, oh, I guess you're not going to cut in June, but that's okay. We're still going to bring the market higher anyways, right? Yes. Um, so it'll be interesting to see you know, how this game continues from here. Um, we'll talk about inflation in just a minute here, but um, real quick, while we're kind of on the topic of, you know, What's driving the market right now is still these top stocks. Um, while there is some more breadth now, it's still largely the mega eight. AI is still the big theme. Um, you just published um, a piece uh, called Speculation in AI May Face Challenges. I'm just wondering if there's any key elements of that report you want to you want to share here before we move on from the topic. Yeah, sure. Um, it, you know, it, it's it. So first of all, you know, I can't tell you everything that's that's in that article but be, because there's a video in there it's an interview with Roger McNamee who's uh, with Elevation Partners um, he is considered one of the geniuses of Silicon Valley in terms of investing in technology and he has a really great interview now I snipped some 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 notes out of that interview and and, and put them in the article so if you go to the website realinvestmentadvice.com and uh, that, that click that article right now. It's the top article on our on, on our page. Um, but you can watch the interview. I've got the link to the CNBC interview for you to watch. It's a really really good interview. And I suggest if you're chasing AI stocks right now, which don't blame me if you are, I do suggest you you read this. Um, the, there's a couple of things that go on with AI. And again, we've talked about before about this relationship between artificial intelligence and the dot-com bubble. And, I'm, and just before you jump off a cliff, I'm not saying that we're having another dot-com <laughs> bubble. I'm just saying there is a similarity to behaviors and expectations in the markets. Um, Adam will, will, will support me on what I'm about to say because he lived through this when he was going to work for Yahoo back then. I'll always uh, support you, Lance. I yeah, I, I understand. But you'll corroborate my, my, my story. Um, back in 1999, companies were literally just throwing up web pages and and changing their names to you know, you know, Roberts and Taggart.com, right? They were just sticking .com on the on the end of anything because if you did that, immediately people would run your stock price up because you were getting involved in the internet. And and here's the important part about that: it was just believed at the time that the internet was going to change the world as we know it, and it did. It changed everything about our world, how we access information, how we work, how we operate, you know, how we communicate. It changed everything. The Internet was this massive invention. The problem, though, was is that it never generated the revenue that was expected in the earnings and the forward outlooks for a lot of these companies. A lot of these companies were trading at 10, 20, 30, 40 times price to sales on expectations that this internet adoption was going to create just this massive revenue boom for these companies. And, you know, you had to buy them now. And if you paid 40 times price to sales today, it was okay because earnings were going to catch up. Sales were going to catch up. The problem was it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was because people couldn't figure out how to monetize the websites. 
And so, yeah, everybody threw up a web page and it allowed small businesses to all of a sudden compete with Fortune 500 companies, right? Because I have a web page, I can sell stuff nationwide, right? I, I wasn't limited to Jackson, Mississippi. I can sell them anywhere over the internet. And it created two problems. One, the revenue never came. And B, it created a massive compression and profitability because all of a sudden there was massive demand and there was massive competition for the same products. All of a sudden, there was a it, this was available to everybody. So if I had a widget to sell, like I wanted to sell this coffee cup, well, there was 900 other people selling coffee cups just like this. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to sell the coffee cup, I had to cut the price of the coffee cup, which ate into my profit margins. So the problem was, is that the X, now did earnings grow? Absolutely. Did things, did things improve? Yes, absolutely. Just not enough to justify 10, 20, 30, 40 times price to sales. That's what's happening today is that we have, ex and then look, and here's the other thing about this. AI has been around for 10 years. If you have an Apple phone, you've got Siri. That's artificial intelligence, right? That's been there for 10 years. We've been doing this for 10 years. The market needed something recently to get out of this malaise from last year. And all of a sudden, everybody just latched onto AI because of chat GPT. Well, the problem with chat GPT is it's free. You don't pay for it. You use it, but you don't pay for it. But it cost a tremendous amount of money to build these AI models. Uh, so if you want to buy a uh, GPU, it's two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. You know the other cards run about one hundred ninety thousand dollars a unit, and and it takes multiples of these units. So you're talking about half a billion dollars to build AI models that are actually going to run. So how many? So first question is: Is how many companies are you investing in that can afford that kind of an outlay? And the second thing is, is that you've got garbage in information. The problem with chat GPT is, is you've got to go back and fact check chat, chat, BT, chat GPT because the information it pull, puts out is just the information that's culling off the internet from its test database. So if there's any information that is false, misinformation, et cetera, in that, then that database of, of, of information it's working from, it's going to put out a false output. It's it's the old statement in math, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. And then and then finally, the last problem is what I just talked about. If Microsoft, as an example, let's say Microsoft is the only company on the planet that has an artificial intelligence model that works. Okay, just say that, and it's doing well, and and, and Microsoft's making money. What do you think is going to happen next? Right? There's going to be 50 other companies that come out and go, oh, I can compete with that, and I can do exactly the same thing, and I can do it cheaper. And so the problem then becomes, so let's talk, and we talked about NVIDIA before, and this is kind of the point of the article, competition is going to bring on lower prices because NVIDIA may sell, a, the, the NVIDIA may sell the very best GPU in the world, arguably it is. AMD now has a GPU. There will be other companies that come out with GPUs and they'll say, you know what, mine's not quite as good as the NVIDIA, I'll admit to that, but it's cheaper. And it'll get you to where you want to go. So if I'm a smaller company that builds an AI model and I can't afford half a billion dollars of, of NVIDIA units, I'm going to go buy somebody else cheaper. Well, eventually NVIDIA goes, I'm going to have to start lowering. If I want to, if I want to hit those 50% revenue growth that I need to do in order to justify 40 times price to sales, I've got to sell more units. That means I have to sell them at a lower cost. And it's just simply a function that that innovation will breed competition, comp competition will breed, will breed lower prices. But again, this is all kind of covered in that article on AI and, and the, the, they face a lot of challenges. It's not, you know, I'm not saying don't buy in artificial intelligence stocks. I'm not saying that at all. There's an opportunity there. They're just very expensive and very overbought right now. Wait for a pullback. But the important thing is, is don't forget to sell them <laughs> because just like in, in 1999, there was a, a bunch of companies that were going gangbusters. And if you sold them along the way and took your money in, you made money. There's companies, uh, JDS Uniphase, Cisco Systems, that have never gotten back to their 2000 peaks. If you bought them back in 2000, you're still underwater today, 23 years later. And, and that's what will eventually happen with a lot of these AI stocks. So there'll be a couple of winners. There's going to be a lot of losers over the long term. So if you chase that market now, just don't forget to sell along the way.
All right. Um, well, well said. And folks, you should definitely go read that article at realinvestmentadvice.com, making Lance's shameless plug there for him. Thank you. Um, I, I've had a lot of great interviews recently, and I'm, I I feel badly. I can't remember which recent interview this, this was stated in, but the speaker was talking about how what we're likely seeing right now, or what we're seeing right now, seems very similar to you know previous big run-ups where there's been a lot of excessive euphoria, particularly about a tech type company. Um, they talked about two examples. One was Amazon back in 98 or 99. It was when Bezos was on the, the man of the year time cover back before it, they still called it man of the year. They hadn't switched over to person of the year yet. And uh, I can't remember what the price was. It might've been like a hundred bucks for share or something like that at the time. But um, uh, if you sold then, um, you know, you would have made a really nice gain. And then after the dot-com bust, Amazon went down to something like, I want to say it was like $6 a share. It was like a, yeah. like a 94% yeah. decline. Yep. And it did eventually get back to $100 a share and then went way far beyond that. Um, but that process took a decade Years. and a half. Yeah. It took a long, long time, right? Same thing with RCA, which was you know a, a behemoth in, in the radio space. And then you know it was getting ready for the advent of TV to come in and change everything, right? And uh, if you bought RCA, I think right before uh, the, the big 1929 market crash, um, uh, if you didn't sell it, you, you didn't get back to that price, even though all that technological development did happen, right? So the promise of the technology in both cases was realized. It just took a lot longer for the underlying intrinsic value of the company to, to rise back up to what the the exuberant price was when the, the market first woke up to the promise, right? So we very well may be saying the same thing here. I, I, I feel comfortable making the call that we are in companies like NVIDIA. <laughs> you know, I, just, I just don't well, see it. But, but let me just, you know, I, I don't disagree with you. Look, NVIDIA is probably going to have a 50% correction at some point just to you know, bring earnings back down and, you know, into some level of, of valuation that makes some sense. I mean, it'll still be expensive, right? I mean, NVIDIA right now could lose 50% of its value and still be trading at 10 times price to sales. So, I mean, even a 50% correction would still leave the stock very expensive from traditional measures. But, you know, that's going to potentially happen at some point. There is a difference, though, this time between Amazon of the late 90s versus today and, and NVIDIA today versus stocks we saw in the late 90s. Is these companies actually make money. You know, back in the late 90s, a lot of these companies didn't have revenue. They didn't have cash flow. They barely had business models that work. And, you know, we were we were trading off these companies based on how many eyeballs per page they were right. getting. And, you know, so there so I, I don't you know, again, there are, you'll see a lot of similarities and you'll see a lot of people putting out articles. And I've even I've even put out graphs as well it says, hey, look, you know, this you know, artificial things running just the same way as we saw back in, in 1999. But there are some fundamental differences. Uh, doesn't mean that you still can't have a big correction. Still doesn't mean that you can't have a, a significant pullback. Still doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, take profits along the way and protect your capital. Um, but, I, you know, just, I, I just want everybody to be careful going, hey, this is just like 1999. Because it's not, there, there are some very fundamental differences as, as, at this time you know, from last time. So just, just be a little aware of that. Okay. I, I think that's good. Um, I, I do think that we're still saying the same thing, that the yeah. risk here is that a share <laughs> of NVIDIA could be worth the same amount an uncomfortable right. number of years out in the future. No, 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 yeah. No argument with that whatsoever. Okay. All right. Um, well, look, um, I, I, on this point, I just want to mention one or two interesting things that I saw recently. Um, one is, um, uh, by the way, was that interview you were talking about? Was that Jim Jim Bianco you had on this week? Yes, it was Jim Bianco I had it this week. I can't remember if it was Jim telling the story or not. It very well could have been. And my apologies yeah. to him if it was. Um, great interview with Jim, and we're going to talk about Jim in a second when we talk about inflation. Um, but but just to the sort of the the level of, um, I guess we'll just say bullishness that's in the market. Um, <clears throat> uh, one is is this, I saw a chart that um, w was basically cheekily asking is is the nasdaq the new crypto because it was charting or is tech the new crypto because it was charting the ndx versus right. the price of ether yeah. and it actually has outperformed the price of ether this year right yeah. so yeah. 
you know, it, it, just a warning sign, you know, is that speculation? Now uh, we can debate on it, but oh, it's no, there, no there, there is no doubt that we've gotten into a very speculative phase of the market, just from a sentiment standpoint. As I said earlier, you know, if you take a look at sentiment, it's just everybody can't get into the market fast enough. That's that is simply FOMO that's going on. So it is very and, and this is the interesting thing, right? So we go back and look at 2020. And you know, you have the big crash in March, 35% down. And then everybody comes in with five trillion dollars worth of liquidity, and you know, just money has to go somewhere, right? And so money just goes into stocks, and we're speculating on. GameStop and AMC and memes, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond, right? Most shorted stocks, et cetera. And, you know, we had that fantastic run. And, and it's interesting now because we're seeing exactly that same type of attitude in terms of investor sentiment, but you don't have this big liquidity push, right? You don't have those big capital injections coming in at this point to drive this, you know, to drive this market substantially higher. And, and, and there's an interesting dynamic that's coming up. And this is one thing, and I'm going to say this, and then you know you can bookmark this for later. We'll see if we'll okay. see if I'm right or not. But we, you and I talked about student loan payments last week, did, did we yep. not? Oh okay. yeah, right. So that's forty. That's that's forty million. That's actually forty four. But that's forty million people at three hundred dollars a month. That's twelve billion a month in revenue. That is about to get sucked out of Amazon and Microsoft. You know. What what have people been using this money for? Buying computers. Right. It's, it's hard to correct you, but it's 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 twelve it's twelve billion of income. Yeah, that's right. right. This, yeah, this is this is people's you know after tax money they're going to have to spend. That that is correct, and so yeah. this is this is twelve billion dollars less that they were spending at Amazon buying crap they didn't need, buying video games, buying you know uh, you know on new iPhones. You know when you and here's the funny thing about this is. When you extract twelve billion dollars a month out of the economy, how is Apple going to sell thirty five hundred dollars VR sets? Right. right. It's just you know, and, and I'm not saying they won't because they will because people will finance that stuff all day long. You know, debt is good. Uh, no, it's not. But <laughs> you, you get my point. But you know, that's the one thing that you know when you when you talk. I hate to use the term "it's different" this time because I'm not I'm not saying that. But that is a difference that we have right now. Versus what we had back in 2020 when we had this type of speculative push in the markets is that the liquidity, right, the ability to have cash to invest is getting extracted from the economy. And I don't think, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but markets have a, a very good ability to price in things, right? Things that we didn't think that the, the markets could price in, they, price, they, they priced in the banking prices, they priced in uh, rate hikes. Um, you know, the market right now is trading has, has basically taken out of the market the impact of every rate hike since last year. We're because we're trading back to March highs of last year. So all those rate hikes the Fed did, the market's already recovered all of that decline. So the market's been amazing at pricing in all these impacts. I don't think the market has priced in this extraction of liquidity that's coming when these student loan payments restart. And I, we debated the debate. It's it's the end of August, beginning of September, whenever it is. But when those repayments restart, you know, we could very well see a very sharp, rapid decline in retail sales in a month. I mean, you can literally see retail sales drop very quickly in a month. I've got an article coming out on this. Uh, it's actually, uh, you know, by the time you air this interview, it'll be on our website. Um, but I've actually got an article uh, posting on Friday talking about the student loan issues and and. Sorry, I, that's a that's a complete lie. <laughs> that's a complete lie. It's next Friday. Next Friday, I'll have this article out. Friday, I'm going through all the recession indicators. So on our website, we'll have a new article going through every recession indicator that says we've got a recession coming, but why don't we have a recession? So that's that's uh, coming up as well. All right, good. Well, I can't read to read wait to read that one. We might even touch on some points of that J just to finish out this this um, bullishness. Um, a couple of other stats. One, uh, J.P. Morgan uh, reports that its clients are the longest they've been in the market since 2019. Um, there was a, a really interesting map that I saw. Um, someone posted to Twitter, and I'll see if I can post it here. Um, it it basically shows um, bullish sentiment by uh, bullish and bearish sentiment by Google searches, and it shows the difference from one week to the next. And basically. Uh, I don't know exactly when this week was. It's relatively recently, but it's probably about a week or so in the past, uh, maybe a little bit further. Um, 
but from one week to the next, the first week was every state except for one, Florida, um, had more bearish searches than they did bullish searches, right? A week later is the almost exact opposite, where 49 states had majority bullish searches except for one state, I think it was Missouri, that was bearish still. Um, so it just showed how quickly we hit that critical mass of sentiment in the country. And then the last point I just want to make, and I'll throw it up here, is the um, the Barron's uh, cover saying that we're now in a new bull market, which is yeah. always somehow the kiss of death, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's and that's also that sentiment change on on searches is that when the market got, you know, had rallied 20% from the October lows, immediately everywhere were headlines on, it's a new bull market. And so not surprising, everybody went Google on, it's like, it's a new bear market, uh, you know, new bull market, really? And, and, you know, so yeah, not surprising to see searches kind of search through the roof. Yeah, and it shows how, you know, I mean, it, it, investors move in herds, right? You know, it's the, the classic men, men lose their minds uh, uh, in, in herds and only regain them one at a time, right? So, exactly. um, all right, well, look, um, uh, since we're talking about sort of the, the bullish narrative now in stocks, um, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit further about things that might get in the way of that. But but forgetting recession and stuff like that for a moment, um, or, or or breakages in the system or whatever, um, I just want to talk for a second about the investment environment we find ourselves in now, where there is a really reasonable alternative to owning equities at this point, yeah. right? Where you have you've got bonds and you've got really safe bonds like Treasuries. That I believe their yield now now uh, beats uh, the the yield on corporate equities, and so you know from a risk return standpoint, you get a much better trade off being in bonds. And if you're at all concerned about valuations now getting rich, you know it, it makes a lot of sense to say, okay, let me take some off the table on the stock side and just slip it over here into the safe bond side. Like, how? how pardon me. It makes perfect sense, but it that's not perfect. how people operate. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. I mean, do you see potential here for bonds to start just vacuuming capital out of the the equity markets? No. Okay. So explain. <laughs> um, well, well, first of all, so so you know what, I, what when I say this, when I say no, no, it's not going to happen yet, right? It will not yet. You know, the the so let's back up to what you just said. So first of all, I can pick up 3.7% on a 10-year treasury right now. I can pick up near 5% on a two-year treasury. So why wouldn't I want to do that? And we talked about that before, which is there's nothing wrong with that. And if I buy a 10-year treasury at 3.7%, now this is, this is the logical side. This is you and me talking, okay? So logically, I can buy 3.7% yield, lock that in for the next 10 years, and I've got roughly 50 to 60% upside when rates turn back to zero. So I'm going to effectively make more money owning bonds right now than owning stocks. So I'm not going to make that this year, right? I'm going to make that over the course of the next few years. I'm going to outperform stocks by owning bonds. So logically, the best investment I can make right now is buying some treasuries. And I can buy, look, I can buy you know, triple B and better rated corporate bonds and pick up six, 7%. If I want to step down the risk curve a little bit, get into some double B pluses, you got to be real careful what you own. But there's some double B plus bonds sitting out there that are yielding seven, 8%. So there, there, there is a real alternative. And again, I buy that. I, if I can buy bonds, the corporate bonds, um, in fact, uh, there's a really good interview. If you catch it, Jeff, Jeff Gunlack did an interview uh, on CNBC not too long ago. Um, talking about this very specific thing. But if I can buy corporate bonds that are trading at a 50 or you know, 30, 40, 50% discount to face value, in other words, these bonds are trading at 50, 60, 70 cents on the dollar because interest rates have gone up, then most of the risk has already been wrung out of these corporate bonds, assuming you're buying good companies, right? I'm not mm -hmm. talking about buying a company that's eventually going to go bankrupt. You can look at the you can look at the balance sheet, determine its interest coverage ratio and those type of things. So if I buy a good fundamentally sound company, I can buy companies that are trading at a deep discount, have gotten most of the risk run out of them. I'm getting a seven, eight, nine percent yield to own them, and then that bond is going to mature at face value. So I'm going to get all that capital appreciation as that bond moves back up to par. Now, 
I get a guarantee, I get a, a, a function of return of capital, plus I get the yield while I'm waiting. Why wouldn't I want to do that? Because it's not making me 10% right now or 164% since the beginning of the year. Why the hell would I want to own bonds when I can own NVIDIA and make 164% since January? Are you stupid? That's the, that's the, that's the emotional trade-off that we have going on. I, look, I've seen this time after time after time. Real example, 2000. Peak of the market in 2000, dividend, uh, CDs at banks, FDIC insured CDs paid 8%. Could not get anybody to buy them in December of 2000, uh, 1999 and January of 2000-ish, right? I was trying to get clients to buy these 8% CDs because I was worried about the financial market going forward. Nobody wanted them because everybody assumed the market was going to keep going up 15% a year as they had just seen it do for the last five years. So nobody wanted 8% CDs. By the time we thousand, everybody wanted them, but those yields didn't exist anymore because yields right, were gone. So this, we have very, as investors, we have a very short focus on what the market's doing today. We don't look at what's going, the market's going to do tomorrow. And this is why I've told you before, you have to play chess when you're making your investments. It's not checkers. And, and see, like a big mistake investors are making right now is they're buying six month treasuries, one-year treasuries, two-year treasuries to get that 5% yield. Like, oh, I'm smart because I'm getting all this yield. What are you going to do when that matures? Because at some point, if Adam's right and we have a recession or we just have an economic slowdown of significance, or if you do have something break, the Fed's going to drop rates to zero. When that bond matures, your alternative is going to be zero on yield. Now, what are you going to do? Right you, now, you've you've locked yourself into a very low rate of return by buying short duration bonds and not looking out that curve and giving yourself time to alternate. Because when that rate drops back to zero, you're going to have to figure out where you're going to put capital next, and that's going to be that's going to be the problem when you get outside of this very short window that you're looking at. And this is the problem that all investors make. I'm not looking down the road two years or three years or four years. I just know right now if I can buy Amazon, I'm making twenty percent this year. So why do I own bonds? That's just stupid to buy bonds when equities are returning, you know, 5% a day type thing, right? So. All right. Um, all right. I get it. And you know human nature way better than I when it comes to investing. <coughs> You've been doing this for a long time. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not shocked that the, you know, the average investor's um, ability to get uh, bedazzled and, and be charmed by, you know, the latest <laughs> fad. I'm just curious, though, from a from an institutional standpoint, you would think those guys would be smarter. They not no. they, they aren't most of the time. All right. They can't. They, they can't be. It's career risk, right? If, if look, if I'm if I'm a look, I have the same problem as a portfolio manager. At the end of this year, you're going to ask me a question next year. It's like, how were your returns last year, right? And so, I better be able to say, yeah, we posted a you know a, a you know we either beat our benchmark or matched our benchmark, whatever it was next year, because we're all focused on those year to year returns. That's career risk. And every professional manager faces this. There's, there's not anybody out there, with the exception of people like Warren Buffett and, and other big institutional investors that don't have the, the, the capital constraints that most mutual fund managers have, most you know, uh, portfolio managers have, et cetera, which is generating this annualized rate of return. Every year we have these articles come out and they say, well, you know, the, the latest S&P 500 speedy, you know, report says that 80% of fund managers underperform their benchmark. Well, of course they did. They have to pay taxes. They have to pay fees. They have to, you know, they have other expenses that an index doesn't have, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's irrelevant, right? Who cares if, you know, a particular fund underperformed from one year to the next. I want to know what it did over the last 10 years, right? What did it do over the last 15 years? There's funds out there like Fidelity Magellan, like Dodging Cox and others that have just decimated the stock market by leaps and bounds if you've just bought them, held them, let the manager do their job. Buffett is another one, right? And those are, you know, that's how we should be analyzing things, but but we're inundated by the media every day Market's up today. Market's down today. Market's up today. Market's down today. How'd you do last year? If you didn't beat the market last year, whoa, boy, you better change managers and go get another manager. That's all Wall Street saying, hey, put money in motion because that's how I make fees. You've got to sell everything you own to buy everything new. I make money off of that. So 
This is all about product marketing and it's all about selling you a, selling you a narrative, selling you a product. You've got to get away from that. And, and again, I, you know, I tell people this all the time. It's like, man, turn off the media. Stop looking at your portfolio every day. It doesn't matter if interest, you know, I get emails from the same people every day. Oh, interest rates were up today. Does that mean this, right? Interest rates were down today. Does it mean this? No, it doesn't mean any damn thing. It just means that the markets are repricing every day for what's happening with yields. It has no direction impact or influence over what's happening long-term, which is all about economics, inflation, and, and interest rates. That's it. That's all that matters long-term. And so, you know, we get so wrapped up in the day-to-day -day thing that we get emotionally stressed. And then we start making emotional decisions that are the worst possible decisions we can make, chasing a artificial intelligence now with no exit strategy, you know, trying to be all in money markets or trying to be all in bonds because I'm worried about equity risk and now equity risks are taking off. Now I'm questioning what I just did. You know, that's markets. This is why having a disciplined approach, having an allocation structure and not worrying about what's happening today, but looking down that road, look down the road three to five years. Where am I going to be in three to five years? How's my strategy going to work? You'll be a lot better investor over time and you'll make a lot more money. All right. All right. Well, very well said. Again, you know, folks, this is why we have an experienced financial capital manager on this channel so that you can get the real skinny from them. Um, all right. So uh, let me just pull this thread for a moment here, too. So, um, um, you know, bonds uh, may become even more attractive uh, coming down the road because central banks are still hiking. Right. So we got our skip from Powell, but it's definitely a skip. It's not a pause. He's been saying, look, we're going to still hike from here. The vast majority of the, the Fed board agreed that we would do the skip, but then we're going to hike probably at least two more times. Um, we've had several central banks um, now re-hike, right? Mm -hmm. So we had the Bank of England, we had the Bank of Norway, and uh, they both hiked 50 basis points. I think both of those were surprises. Uh, and then the Swiss National Bank uh, just hiked 25 basis points this morning. Yeah. So this very well may be a preview of what's to come. Um, and this is where I want to get into Jim Bianco's uh, world. So, of course, they're doing this because of inflation, right? Um, but real, real quick, just yep. but I need I need to stop you right here so we have a good baseline where we're going off on. Great. This is going to be important. Um, what the Fed is doing is to control inflation. That's all on the short end of the curve. We've talked about this before. Two years and less, that's what the Fed controls. Yep. Out there on the end of the curve, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, that's all economic growth and where real inflation is, right? And economic growth. So, you know, when you start talking about long term over the next 10 years, where's inflation going to be 10 years from now? That's a diff. The, the Fed does not control that end. That's all economics. On the short end, it's the Fed interest rate. So, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. These banks are hiking interest rates. The Fed is going to hike interest rates again. The market right now does not believe the Fed. I think they're stupid, but they don't believe the Fed. The Fed, right. Well, so one of the things that might force the, the market to wake up here is a conversation I had with Jim the other day, which is he was talking about um, the base base effects in terms of how um, CPI is is calculated. You and I have talked about this um, many times. And, and he is willing to go out and say inflation is going to go up this summer. Yeah. Um, because the, the the base effect comparisons become a lot less generous. And he was saying that, you know, a year ago, June, the monthly CPI for that month was somewhere like a percent and a half. It's much 1. lower. 1.2. 1.2. Okay, 1.2%, much lower this time around. Um, so CPI will come down in June, but then it was 0.0% in yep. July, right? Yep. Highly, highly unlikely we're going to have monthly CPI that low here. So CPI is probably going to tick up in July. And you said there's a few others like 0.1s, 0.2s in there. Yeah. Um, so very likely we're going to see CPI start marching up. Now, I'm sure the Fed is aware of this. That's probably why they're still talking about doing some more hikes. But um, but optically, it just looks really bad. And it's probably going to put a lot of pressure on them, especially as we're going into a, an election year, to be seen as being even more aggressive You know, coming yeah. out from this. And the market's not expecting that. Market's expecting this decline in CPI to continue. Um, there's another effect that's coming in, right? Uh, so you and I were talking about housing last year, right? The slowdown in housing. Mm -hmm. Housing makes up roughly about 40% of CPI. So the homeowner's equivalent rent thing, right? right? Um, but all of a sudden, we're starting to see housing activity pick back up again. 
So this, this whole idea that housing was going to crash, and that was going to be a big drag on inflation. And there is a lag. There's about a three month lag to housing. So it's got to, it takes about three months for price changes to show up. But, you know, you look at the housing starts this month, huge jump in housing starts because there's, again, we talk about this, baby boomers aren't selling their houses because if I sell my, I can't downsize because if I downsize, my payment goes up because of interest rates, right? So a lot of baby boomers are getting stuck in their houses. So existing home sales, there's not enough inventory. Right, they dried up, yeah. Yeah, they dried up. So now you've got this lack of inventory. Now home builders are trying to build inventory and you're seeing home construction pick up. Multifamily apartments are going like gangbusters right now because people can't afford to buy houses. So all that's going to feed in and keeping that homeowner's equivalent rent probably a lot more elevated than what the market's anticipating. And so that's the one thing I'm watching really carefully. Okay. Um, yeah, I just recorded a, a great discussion with Ted Oakley that's going to uh, air this coming week. Um, and he did kind of you know, clarify something we were scratching our heads about earlier where we were talking about, hey, this housing market's really looking pretty awful. How are the home builders at all-time highs? <laughs> and it's basically because it's not that dissimilar what's happening in, in, in the car market, where um, in the housing market, the existing uh, current units are not selling because, as you said, the people that are in them can't really afford to move, right? They, they, they don't want to get hit with the higher mortgage rates. Um, the home builders don't have that problem. They're, they're, they're releasing inventory now into this market, right? That's really inventory hungry, right? right. And, and they're able to actually outcompete the, the existing stock by offering points and all sorts of little tricks and, you know, sleights of hand that they do. So they're actually apparently, you know, having really good revenues right now because there's a hot demand for, for these new homes. Yeah, and I tell you that you know home build. You know, we were talking about last week. Home builders are trading near all time highs or at all time highs, and their their fundamentals are cheap. I mean, you take a look at some of these home builders; they're trading at you know 10, 11, 12 times earnings. You know, one, two times price to sales. That's that they're fundamentally cheap companies and pay a dividend. So they're really overbought right now. You have to wait for a pullback, but I've got no problem with you buying home builders on a pullback. Okay. Um, all right. I'm trying to figure out if I would make that same statement. I still am, am kind of. <laughs> uh, bearish for the housing market overall in the long run, yeah. but, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. Uh, this is probably one of your um, statistics that you're going to mention in your report that comes out tomorrow. Um, but looking at leading economic indicators, uh, they've tumbled for the 14th straight month here. So I, I just wanted to pull that up as an example of the continued flotilla of, of macro data that belies the market optimism here. Um, and uh, and this is one that you know you've reminded us many times. Pretty much as a perfect track record of determining you know when recession when we're in a recession, and certainly we are well into recessionary readings on this indicator. Yeah, uh, the 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 indicator you want to look at is not just the LEI index. Uh, no, no, it's fine to look at just the LEI index. There's nothing wrong with that. But really, what you want to pay attention to is the six month rate of change in the leading economic index. That has a near, not near, it has a perfect track record of predicting recession. So if it doesn't have a recession this time, this will be the first time since like the 1960s that it's been wrong. So, you know, there's there's always the first time with an indicator being wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that's where we are right now. That's And so the, the article tomorrow, uh, or sorry, the article yesterday, because this is on Saturday. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, the article yesterday um, was talking about these recession indicators. And I go through, I go through the, the leading economic index is one of them. And of course, um, we go through our, our own economic composite indicator, which comprises a hundred different data points of service, manufacturing, uh, OECD indicators. I mean, just really a broad look at economic activity. That's in recessionary territory. Um, you know, you go through all these indicators, they're all just inverted yield curves, right? We have a hundred percent of the 10 yield curves we track all inverted. So, you know, everything is screaming, you're going to have a recession, yet it just doesn't seem like we're going to get there. And, and what I think it is, and this is kind of the statement I make, is that because of all that monetary liquidity that's still chunking around the system, now you got that $1.7 trillion of and the Inflation Reduction Act going in, um, that's been postponing, that's been, that's been kind of, you know, giving the economy enough support to kind of weather these economic downturns, you know, so far. But again, what's important is, is that economic growth is slowing. We were at near 12% nominal 
We're now down to two. That's going to keep declining here. And at some point, we'll probably get below zero at some point. But that's kind of the point of the article is that, you know, review all these recession indicators. They all say we're going to have a recession. But just because we haven't had one yet doesn't mean that we can't have one. It just may be delayed until next year sometime. And I'm curious, having gone through this exercise as recently as you have, like where does Lance Roberts' gut come on this? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's look, this is this is I was having this conversation today. I um, we manage money for some other firms as well. Like, you know, so so we manage money for clients. I also manage money for other RIAs for their clients. And I was having a conversation with one of the advisors there at, at their firm. And you know, he was, he's like, look, he says, I've been an analyst since 1998. I have been through these markets. I navigated, you know, 2000 well. I navigated 2008 well. I just don't understand this market. None of this makes any sense. And I'm like, well, join the club. <laughs> because, you know, nobody understands this market right now. Fundamentally, it makes no sense whatsoever. Technically, it makes no sense whatsoever what's going on. It is it, there is a, a clear bullish bias to the market. And this is, you know, this the we all have here is we're trying to apply logic. You know, we're going through all these indicators every week. And this is why, look, this is why I write articles saying, look, here's all the recession indicators. This is what they say. And you know, they we should be having a recession, but we're not. And so we have to go with the data that we have that says the markets are doing fine right now. We're in a bullish uptrend. Those things remain until they're not. At some point, my gut tells me that we're going to have a second leg of you know, this market, whatever it is, as we try to process through all of this recessionary data. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to go down 50% from here. It could, right? But you're going to need something to really break. I mean, you're going to have to have like major credit risk failures or something like that to really bring this market down. It's going to, have to be something that's very sudden and unexpected, like uh, JP Morgan fails. We're talking about a major, no, it's going to have to, and that my, I'm not being facetious. I'm saying- I'm, it's going I'm to, laughing because that would like bring the world down at this point. Yeah, uh, it would. Given its but systemic it, importance, sadly. But well, yeah, it is. But it's going to, but my point is, is it's going to have to be something really big, right? That really just shakes the foundation of the market entirely. Um, that's what would bring the market down 50%. Most likely, the next leg of this is going to be a 10 to 15 to 20 percent decline, tacking on to what we did in 2022. Uh, we'll retest the lows of October of last year, maybe even set new lows as possible. Um, but because we need to come back and we, we need to revert valuations to a degree, you know, one of the key defining differences between a bear market, which everybody said last year was a bear market, it wasn't. The difference between a bear market and a correction is a bear market reverts valuations. We never reverted valuations. Right. Valuations are still very elevated. In fact, the NASDAQ valuations have increased by about 30 to 40% since the lows of October and are now challenging its peak valuations that we saw back post the financial crisis and post 1999. So, you know, it is, you know, we've had very, very steep valuation increases in, in stocks and NASDAQ, NVIDIA, good example. Um, that aren't justifiable. So you're going to have another leg of this correction that brings down those valuations at some point. And that would be coincident with probably a much slower economic environment. That's my gut. Whether or not that happens, you don't bet on that, right? That's the expectation that may happen in 12 to 18 months, maybe 24 months, maybe 36. The problem is we don't know when it'll happen. We have fairly high confidence it will happen. And but between now and then, this market could be up another 20 percent and, you know, before you get that correction. And so, you know, here's the challenge. And I said this before, you're you could sit here today and go, you know what? I'm out. Right. Just get me out. This market's run it's too stupid where it is. I'm out. So great. You get out in cash. The market runs another 20 percent from here and you go, well, I guess I'm wrong. I'm going to get in. And then it corrects right back to where you are. And now it's a much better risk reward. Valuations have corrected, prices are better, you're deeply oversold, and this is the opportunity to buy you know, into equities, but you're right here where you were today, but at a point in the future. And, and that's the challenge of this market and why you can't make these decisions that I'm just gonna be out and wait because by the time it's for you, time for you to get back in, you're gonna go, well, it's still overvalued because it's where it was two years ago. That's deeply different. 
right? Because of what's happened with prices. The, the difference That's, between price and value is what you're talking correct. about. Yeah. Correct. And so this is why it's so important not to let your emotional biases weigh in and, you know, keep a view on the logical thing, right? Because we do, the fundamentals matter, the, the logic matters, all that matters. And we're paying very close attention to that. But right now we also got to make money in the short term. We have opportunity and then we have long-term opportunity. Long-term opportunity is coming where I can buy stuff, put it to work, and then you and I can stop doing videos because we'll talk in right. 10 years, you know, when it's when it's when the next leg is over. But right now, we've got a short-term trading opportunity we take advantage of. The long-term investment opportunity is probably still coming. All right. All right. And you made a really good argument for why we have you on the show. One, to give us that that big strategic line of thinking, but also the fact that nobody knows how it's going to play out. So we'll have you here every week kind of <laughs> tracking what is happening, right? right. Yeah. Um, and I tell you guys, I cannot wait for the day where you and I can be talking about the great valuations that are out there in the market and, and which of the many of them, you know, do we want to pick as the best contenders for growth over the next five to 10 years, right? I mean, yeah, that will yeah. be a wonderful time. That would, that would be a wonderful time. And I've been waiting for that for the last 13 years. So I know, yeah. I know. but how nice will it be to have people telling us we're being too bullish for a change, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, look, just to, just to stay on the parade of, of concerns for a moment, um, I'm going to get to the state of the consumer in a second, but there was a headline that caught my attention. I just thought I'd throw it up here. I don't know if you have anything to add to it, but um, uh, it says that uh, the Atlantic is very unseasonably warm right now um, or hot. And that May of this year has seen the highest temperatures of any May in the Atlantic since 1850. Um, and I grew up on the Atlantic seaboard and up in New England. And, you know, you know that a hot, season in the Atlantic means, uh, you know, much more likely you're going to have more hurricanes and more powerful hurricanes um, because you have all that that heat energy that's, mm -hmm. you know, spinning the storms up. Yeah. Um, and no, so, it's not climate change. OK, <laughs> uh, let's put that aside for a second. I don't want to create a, a, a huge. Well, no, no, uh, no, no, I'm but, saying that you're, you're going to hear a lot of it, right? It'll be, oh, you know, the, 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 the seas are getting warmer. It's it's Climate change is, is impacting us. That no, it's El Nino, and we go through these phases in in the the atmosphere of La Nina and El Nino, and we just went through a La Nina phase where temperatures are a bit cooler. We're about to go through a phase where these temperatures are much warmer for the next couple of years. So we're going to see more hurricanes, higher temperatures. That's just a function of the environmental system and the way it works. And, and that's we're just into one of those phases right now. And that's why it's freaking 100 degrees in Texas right now. And we, we're just preheating. We're not even in the summer yet as far as Texas goes. So, you know, we're going to be seeing temperatures in Texas. We'll, we'll, we'll be talking about record temperatures in Texas and, you know, uh, demand on heat grids it has nothing to do with climate change. It has simply to do with the La Nina and El Nino patterns that are going on. And we're about to go into an El Nino pattern, which is a lot hotter. Okay, so that that's going to result in more hurricanes. Likely, it's likely going to result in more yeah. hurricanes, um, and and so those are those are just kind of like you know curveballs that Mother Nature throws at us during the year in terms of how how damaging they might be, right? Yeah. So that's you know potential outlays that we don't have factored into our you know national budget yet at this point in time, right? And the disruption that that may have in, in certain parts of commerce um, related to this weather. Um, just pulled up a headline here that says. Uh, I guess it's pretty hot in Kansas right now too, not too far from either <laughs> in Texas. Yeah. Says that that uh, yeah, he, that wheat farmers in the state will reap their smallest harvests in more than sixty years. So my my point is just, um, you know, humans are generally bad at assessing risk, especially risks that aren't immediate and, and incredibly visible. We've talked about this a lot in the past. Um, and that's just sort of general, but we do a really bad job of budgeting for the unexpected. And it seems like this year we we may have, you know, our, our healthy share or maybe even unfair share of the unexpected. And certainly from a climate standpoint or weather standpoint, it looks like it's starting off that way. So anyways, just curious if you had anything to add to this in terms of like, you know, how destabilizing the mix could get with some of these natural curveballs that may come our way. Yeah, no, the, you know, first of all, buy utility stocks. Right. Um, because utilities get paid on how much electricity you draw. And like I said, in Texas right now, we're still preheating for summer. Right. It, we our hot temperatures are July and August. 
we're not even, we're, we're really just about, you know, to the, the end of June and we're already hitting hundred plus, we've had hundred plus degree days for the last three days. Uh, heat index has been hitting 108, 109, 110. I went out running last weekend because uh, on the weekends I put my miles in. And when I got back from running, I did about a five mile sprint and came back. And my wife said, did you go swimming? Because I mean, <laughs> my clothes were literally just dripping wet. I mean, it looked like I'd literally just gotten out of the pool of you know swimming and we don't have a pool at our house so that was kind of a stupid question but anyway <laughs> but you know it's it's hot right it's hot so that means you know even if you keep the temperature of your house at a higher level right so let's say that you know you keep your house at 75 76 degrees right you're trying to conserve energy so you know you put your temperature a little bit higher level and in Texas, as example, every every room has a ceiling fan, pretty much. So, you know, we've constantly got air blowing and you know, that way we can kind of, you know, raise our temperatures a little bit. Um, but the air conditioner is running nonstop to try to keep you at 75, 76. If you try to keep your temperature lower than that, you're you're about to get a thousand dollar electric bill coming in the door here pretty quick. So, you know, utilities, companies like, um, you know, Nextera Energy and, and others, they're about to have a huge jump in revenue as this is coming along. So, you know, those have been underperforming stocks as well this year because of interest rates, but they're about to have a nice jump in revenue because of these, these warmer temperatures. Um, on the other side of this, yeah, definitely take a look at, at if you want to play commodity futures. Yeah, definitely take a look at wheat, corn, other type of, of commodities that are heat sensitive because it's going to impact and reduce the supply of those commodities in the markets. Less supply, higher prices. So cattle is the same thing. Um, you know, we're going to see potentially right. higher meat prices as well. Der so. Derivative of wheat. Yeah. Cattle eat the wheat. Yeah. Or cattle eat the grain. So, um, so, yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's certainly way. My, my point is, is look, this is, this is a natural event that occurs. It occurs every few years and they cycle, these cycles happen within the economy or within, within the environment. And that's going to have this warmer, this warmer environment is going to have negative impacts on consumers. And so there are ways to play it. And then you just got to kind of think through the process of, okay, what's going to happen and, and where can I capitalize on that? So how, how vulnerable are insurers to, to these types of weather issues? Uh, do they get hit hard or do they have enough buffers that they're generally okay? Well, it depends. Um, you know, we've had, we've had warm years where we didn't really have, you know, big hurricane impacts. And we've had years where we just had, you know, down the Gulf Coast, you know, from Florida to Texas, we just, you know, one hurricane after another, just, you know, making landfall and doing billions of dollars in damage. So it really just depends. And, and we're going to know soon because we're just about to get into hurricane season. So, you know, you're going to start hearing a lot about uh, tropical, tropical Storm Alice and the, you know, we, mm -hmm. we name them alphabetically, right? So, um, you know, if we have a higher number of tropical storms that increase it and the, the warmer the water is, the higher propensity that there is going to be for tropical storms to turn into hurricanes. And of course, if they're forming in that Gulf because of the Gulf Stream and the way the Gulf Stream, you know, hooks around uh, from Texas over to Florida, when, you know, the, when that hurricane enters the Gulf and it hits that warmer Gulf Stream, it's going to push that hurricane, depending on where it enters, up the coast. So if, if a hurricane comes in towards the Yucatan Peninsula and Mexico, it's going to hook up into Texas. If it heads towards Texas, it's going to hook up into Louisiana, uh, you know, Alabama, Georgia. If it comes in on the on the further side, it's going to impact Florida because they're hanging out there in the wind. So, you know, it just depends on where it hits. So if, if you have multiple hurricanes that hit, the insurers aren't set for multiple billions of dollars of repeated impacts over a very short period of time. They're good for one or two or three, but if we have four or five that impact the Gulf Coast, you know, it's going to impact insurers. Okay. All right. Well, look, who knows what's going to happen here, but I just wanted to flag it for yeah, folks. I'm not a meteorologist, so yeah, let's just <laughs> neither am I, but but I just wanted to flag it as, as an element in the mix here that we haven't really given nod to recently. And just given these early readings, maybe it's going to be in play this year. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, just trundling over to the consumer. Um, you know, it's not looking so good for all the reasons that you and I have been talking about, Lance, right? I mean, if you're in the top 10% that owns the vast majority of financial assets, probably a pretty good year for you, to be honest. Um, but if you're a regular Joe or, or Jane, uh, it's probably a tougher and tougher year. There was an article I read on Zero Hedge that basically was just a compilation. And these were just anecdotes, but they were a compilation taken from Reddit of people talking about, uh, I guess, in a, a board there of... Um, 
just how it's getting harder and harder to get by. And uh, I mean, the stories are just human stories and they really are like, you know, they tug at your heartstrings because in many cases, these are people, some of them making six figures collectively yep. and just saying like, look, there's just nothing left over or gosh, we're having to dip into savings or, hey, we're having to make like really, really hard compromises right now in our to our lifestyle and and we're not in a recession and we're making six figures right so if it gets worse than this one of us loses our job like we don't know what we're going to do right um so anyways a couple of stats here coming from um uh, price Co uh, price waterhouse coopers uh just released their uh 2023 hopes and fears global workforce survey uh it's a big survey it pulls about 54,000 people from um like 46 countries it says here um, it showed that a growing number of households struggled to pay bills every month or could not pay bills most of the time. Um, the share of workers who said their household could not pay their bills most of the time doubled from the previous survey. Um, the percentage of workers who say their household can pay all the bills every month and still have some money left over to either sock away or use on discretionary spending fell from 47% the last time the survey was done to only 38% now. And um, one worker in five they found was doing multiple jobs, had multiple jobs. And 69% of those said they were doing so um, because they needed the extra income to get by. Only 30%, 36% were saying they were doing it to like learn a new skill, to skill up. Yep. So, you know, it's just showing this deterioration in the consumer household that you and I have talked about forever, right? We've got, what is it, like 24 months in a row of declining real wages. Um, I showed that chart the other week of the um, declining labor leverage ratio here that, you know, for, for a little while there, workers had some bargaining power. We, you know, quits were high, people were demanding all sorts of things to be able to, you know, come back to the office or continue to do work. Those days are now ending. We're we're getting back into the great resignation, becoming the great, you know, unretirement party and great, please, sir, may I keep my job or get my old job back party, right? Um, we're seeing uh, the rise in revolving debt uh, now back at record high levels because people are having to fund more and more of their lifestyle on plastic. Um, we're seeing that revolving debt charge the highest uh, interest rates it's, it's ever charged. Um, savings rates, you know, no surprise are plummeting at this point in time. And we're starting to see defaults creep up like in auto loans and things like that. So we're just really seeing the consumer struggle here. And I haven't read the report that you're, you're going to release tomorrow. So I'd like to kind of hear your thoughts on top of this, but like from the data that I have looked at, I mean, I don't see a lot of rescue here for these guys. And I can see potentially a recession at some point ahead, which could make this worse, right? Job yeah. losses kick into the mix here. It's going to get a lot worse. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, that's what the, that's what the Fed has been clear that they want. They want higher unemployment. And, you know, that's, that's, you don't, you don't want to wish that on anybody, right? But, you know, in order to bring down inflation, you've got to have unemployment. So we well, have to kill demand and that's its mechanism for killing demand, right? Yeah. Right. But, but let's step back and explain that real quick. Cause I don't think a lot of people understand this entirely. Um, so our economy is 70% based on consumption, right? So we're a consumer-based economy. The problem is, is you cannot consume unless you produce first. In other words, Adam has to do some form of labor. We don't know really what Adam does for a living, but you know, whenever he does work and actually does work and gets paid, that's production. <laughs> hey, and if you figure it out, tell me, buddy. Okay. Uh, I will. So once Adam gets paid, now he's got money, right? He's like, look, I got a check. And he can run out and he can go buy stuff, right? So the consumption part can only occur after the production. Consumption cannot occur first. You have to produce first in order to consume. And that's just the function of the economy and how it grows over time. Now, to, to what Adam's talking about here is that in order to reduce that consumption, I've got to reduce the production. I've got to have people making less money so that they have less money to spend. Once I can reduce the consumption, 70% of the economy, then I slow economic growth, i.e. a recession, that reduces that reduction in demand and reduced economic growth brings down inflation. What is inflation? Inflation is simply prices, supply and demand. That's all it is. I've got X amount of supply, I've got X amount of demand, and you just, it's the basic you know, economic 101 graph. You know, You have, Supply, demand, where they cross, that's the price. And so in order to bring the prices down, 
I've got to either reduce demand or reduce supply, one of the two. Well, I'm not going to reduce supply initially until I start getting into recession, and I reduce supply after. It's a lagging effect of redu reduced demand. So demand has to decline first, then manufacturers go, hey, I don't have as much demand, so I'm not going to produce as much. That brings down demand, supply, all that comes down, that brings down your inflationary pressures in the economy. That's what the Fed wants by getting unemployment higher. They, they want that to occur. And again, that's a bad situation. We don't want anybody to lose their job. That's just, nobody wants to be out of work. But that's what we've got to get to. And you know, right now, a lot of people have a lot of savings still, right? There's still a lot of savings that we gave people a bunch of money, right? They paid off credit cards. And so they, they have the ability to run credit card debt back up. Well, now they have. And those interest payments are coming in hot. But so far, they still got an extra 300, 350 bucks a month that they weren't having to pay on student loan debt to help meet those obligations. That's about to go away. So this is what we talked about earlier, that the real, the real catch here potentially for that big reduction in demand is coming with those student loan repayments. And, I, and again, as I said earlier, I don't think the market's factoring in that just yet. I think the market's kind of overlooking. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's student loans, right? It's, it's a couple hundred people. It's not. It's 44 yeah. million people. It's right. not. And, and that, that's starting, is it starting beginning of September or beginning of October? When I, I, you know, I, I, we, I've had different dates thrown out at me. Um, I, you know, I, you know the, the most consensus that I get is around September the 1st. Okay. So let's just go with that. I'm sure I'll get 50 emails giving yeah. me dates. No worries. But my, 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 point is, is, my point is this soon. Yeah, it's just it's two, two months away. Yeah. yeah. Or, or three on the outside, right? But yeah. it's like, yeah. So this is this is not an academic risk that you're waiving here. It's, it's a relatively imminent one. All right. Well, look. Um, okay. but, 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 but real quick right. to your point, though, just, just you know, it, 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 you know, I'm, I'm very budget conscious in our household and my wife and I both are. We, you know, we have a function that we have a specific amount of money we live on every month. And, you know, it's just, you know, we're, we're pretty cautious about how we spend money. And, you know, right now all our ACs are running at 76, 77 degrees because our electric bill was like 500 bucks last month. So we're trying to get that down some, um, you know, you know, but what is, what is amazing to me and is that, you know, the cost of living is expensive. I mean, it's uh, the other night, you know, we went to a fairly inexpensive restaurant. It was, it was Father's Day. So my son drove down from, from uh, Texas A&M to come visit. And so it was me and him, my wife and our two daughters. And we went out to dinner and it was at a fairly cheap, it was a Chinese food restaurant, right? So it's Chinese food isn't normally very expensive, but the tab was well over a hundred bucks for Chinese food, right? And, and normally, you know, a couple of years ago at that same restaurant, it's, it's been a, a household favorite for a long time. I went back and looked the same dinner for the same five people was about 70 bucks, right? So it, it's gone up dramatically in terms of the cost of, of eating out, right? And so, you know, and I've been kind of wondering about this because when I go out, you know, to, to, you know, do business or whatever, restaurants are full. They're packed in Houston. I don't know about everywhere, but in Houston, restaurants are packed. And I'm like, how are all these people affording to eat out? Because it's, it's expensive, right? I mean, it's really expensive. And then you start talking about electric bills and, and all these other things. And I just scratch my head over, you know, if you're not making, a hundred thousand plus, you know, it's got, and you've got two or three kids, it's got to be tough to make, you know, kind of make ends meet and, and get all the bills paid and taxes and all those type of things. So it's, it's, it's quite amazing to me how resilient the consumer has been over the course of the last, you know, year and a half. It, it is to me too. And it's, I'm glad that you sort of asked that question of like, how are all these people for it? Cause I feel like I just live in that world and have been in that world for a couple yeah. of years now. Right. It's just like, I, I, I look at the data and I know that on average, these people are struggling more, yeah. but you go out and you're like, God, it's packed here, right? So I'm, I'm glad there's someone else asking that same thing. But like, you know, th well, that's I what we go up to people in restaurants and go, how do you afford to eat? I know. I, know. <laughs> uh, I vote for you to go ask that the first time. We'll <laughs> yeah, <see how>. no. <laughs> um, but he, here's my fear. And it kind of maps back to your comment about like, yeah, people won't go into bonds because that's just not how they think, right? My, my fear is, is that people are 
you know, kind of like a lot of, I think homeowners are right now, which is we'll just hunker down and then we'll just, we'll make it through this part. And then the Fed will start cutting rates and we'll go back to the way yeah. that things used to be. Right. And I think people are like, look, um, I'm just going to put it on the plastic. I'm not going to downshift my behavior yet until I don't have to. And, and, and then maybe something good will happen before that. And then I can, yeah. I, I don't have to worry. There's not going to be a real repercussion from here. And I, and I feel that that's, Sadly, a lot of times sort of human nature is to kind of have that overly optimistic, maybe sometimes kind of magical thinking. Um, and, and then you get the Hemingway problem, right? Which is how do you go broke? Well, you know, gradually and then suddenly, right? Where it's just like all of a sudden, bang, I just uh, cut off from my cards or something yeah. happened and I lost my job or whatever. And then bang, we are really unprepared for this. And I, I, I fear that there's too many households that I'd like that that might be kind of moving towards that destiny. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. You know, I think one thing that may be factoring into this right now is, look, the market's doing well this year, right? The markets are up over, you know, 12%, 13% for the year, whatever yeah. it is. So there is that wealth effect that is sure. kicking. So, you know, people right now going, yeah, man, I'm really tight, but man, my stock market portfolio is doing really good. So I'm not going to sell anything over there, but I can spend some extra money because, you know, I, I made $2,000 in my investment account this month so I can go spend an extra couple of grand. Um, you know, the problem is, is when that evaporates. Right. right. And add to that, too. Oh, everyone's saying we dodged the recession. So, you know, I don't have to worry. about. Yeah. It. Yeah. So I think there is a bit of that that kind of confidence. And we're, and we're certainly seeing that in the, in the you know, the the confidence indicators of both investors and consumers. We're seeing yeah, that they're creeping back up again. Yeah. Yeah. Consumer confidence has been ticking up since May slowly. Right. But it is ticking up. And coincidentally, you know, we're seeing the stock market tick up as well. So, you know, it, it is just kind of, of fascinating when, you know, you look at the and and I've done, you know we do a lot of discussions and talks about the average consumer, the average investor, the average person, and you know the average person isn't financially very well off, and you know the average person doesn't have a lot of money in savings. There isn't a, a cushion to fall back on if they lose their job. You know most households are within a month of being evicted, right? right. Yeah, and, and if I can just underscore your point there, the average is. The average numbers aren't great when you look at the average numbers, but they're deceptive because they're pulled up by the yep. people who have all the money, right? Yeah, so correct. if you look at the median, right, it's really bad. It's it's much worse than the average. Yeah, it, it is. And you know, I, and and look, you know, I just want to, you know, and it's always important to come back to this point, you know, especially when you make a comment like, you know, when you look at all the people that have all the money, right? Um, you know. Capitalism still works, and you know, and and we have the opportunity to take advantage of it. We have the opportunity to do better with ourselves financially. We just have to be willing to do that. And and it's interesting. I've been getting a lot. So you changed on your website uh, the income ranges for individuals, and there's now a choice. So if somebody goes online and says, "Hey, I'm interested in help. I have less than one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars." That's fine. No, no problem with that at all. But what I find interesting is, is that I send them an email. I say, look, if you have less than $150,000, here's where you need to be starting. And especially a lot of these that are coming in, they're young, right? They're 30, they're 35, they're 28, whatever. So they're fairly young in age. And I'm like, first things first is take six months worth of that money, stick it into a, a money market account. Don't touch it. That's your emergency fund. That's in case you lose your job. Um, go fully fund your 401k plan. So if you, you can put in 22,500 a year right now into your 401k plan at work. So do that, right? It's, it's 1875 a month. Change your allocation at work to do that into your 401k plan. And get the free money match if you're a player on it. Free money match and, and get the tax deferral on that. And plus you get, these are pre-tax dollars that are going into that plan. So you're not paying tax on that money today. Okay, so I'd, I'd say that. Um, if you're married, then go contribute $6,000 to a spousal IRA. And then after that, if you have any money left over, um, start putting that into an S&P fund and just do it every month. And don't worry, just turn everything off and just S dollar cost average to an S&P 500 fund for the next 30 years. You're going to be awesome if you do that. And it's, amazing. It's, it's very simple, right? Building wealth is super simple. You've got to save 30 to 40% of your income. And that's exactly where the whole conversation stops. Because as soon that's as really I say 30 to 40% of your income, like, I can't do that. And I understand, right? We, we've got to have cars. We've got to have houses. We've got to have all these things. Well, you have a choice to make. You can either do what's necessary today to build wealth and it's going to suck, right? I, there's just no way around it. As they say in the, mil in the military, embrace the suck. You're just going to have to do it. 
Yep. Um, and, and it's going to suck for a few years and then it'll get easier. And as your income increases, guess what? So do your savings. And you'll start seeing that stuff compound. And you learn to live within that 60 to 70% of your income that, that comes in the household after taxes. You learn to live on that. And you learn to live within that budget. And yeah, you may not be able to buy the new car this year, or you may not be able to buy, you know, the house you wanted right away. You may have to wait. And then, you know, then the next one says, well, I want to buy a house. Okay, well, that's another 20% you got to save somewhere else. You know, so, you know, but the process of building and saving and investing is not hard. There's no get rich quick scheme about it. But this is, see, this is what we've turned all the markets into. And even, even this, even you and I having these discussions, the emails that I get are like, okay, well, what's the fastest way to build wealth in the market? There is no fast way. Right. There's only one way to do it, to do it right. You may, you may speculate in the market now and you may make a bunch of money this year, but let's go talk about the retail investors back in 2020 that made a bunch of money in 2021 and then lost it all in 2022. That's what markets will do to you if you speculate and gamble in the markets. You do it the right way, it'll grow slowly over time, and you'll have a lot of money to retire with, but it's 30 years from now. And see, that's that's the thing that we've got to get into and, and that we've got to do better teaching about is how to make the markets work for us. But that starts with creating cash flow at home. That starts with creating a lifestyle that will support wealth over time. And that does, and that means that you can't be driving a Maserati today. Sorry. Yeah, no, so I'm so glad you brought all this up. Um, and we've touched on parts of this in the past, but just to reiterate a couple of really important points. Um, uh, I've sort of talked about it um, like, well, first off, I, I really should just remind everybody here, you're getting advice from guys. Lance lived, you know, in a car for a couple of years. Um, I had my own equivalent experiences of that. Um, so you're talking to guys who, who you know, ha have lived what they're about to say, but but, you know, that's our bias, right? Like we we know it can be done, right? Um, but you're a fitness guy. I'm kind of into fitness too. Um, I think about these as muscles, right? And in in ultimately you want to have a well-balanced, you know, musculature system, but there's a progression with how you want to start developing these muscles. And I would say first start the earning muscle, right? right. You know, can't do anything with income if you have no income, right? So, so start figuring out how to earn income, invest in yourself, get good education, get good mentors, you know, get good work experience early in life, encourage your kids to work, you know, all that type of stuff, right? So start creating the best income stream or collection of streams that you can. The second is then the, the, the savings muscle, right? This is the frugal living part of life. And, and a reminder from the millionaire next door, the number one characteristic that self-made um, wealth generators have is frugality, right? So you start earning, you start really practicing that. And that's what Lance is talking about. Take that money, you know, reduce your cost footprint as much as possible. Take as much as you can, ideally 30 to 40%, and shovel that into you know, some sort of savings program. Lance said, uh, set it and forget it, you know, S&P fund, great, right, whatever. Eventually, you will want to build your investing muscles. Yeah. But really, you've got limited options anyways, until you have a certain amount of assets, you or a financial advisor, they just have limited things they can do with it if it's if it's below a certain level. So your focus is to graduate the amount above that threshold. That then opens a whole bunch of new doors of opportunity for you. And that's when you can really start to build the investing muscles of, okay, great. How do I diversify? You know, how do I value companies? How do I, you know, think about stocks versus bonds? All that type of stuff. So that's really the progression you should be going after, which is start with the earning, then focus like crazy on the savings, then start the investing. And of course, you're continuing to exercise each muscle as you go to the next one. So when you're saving, don't stop earning and vice versa, right? <laughs> So I, I, I think you I think you agree with that progression, right, Lance? No, no, absolutely. You know, and this you know, it's always about trying to get the cart before the horse. And and the reason that people want to jump into the investing part is because we've taught everybody the market's a casino, and so I can take a little bit of money and I can build all my wealth in the stock market. Nobody has ever gotten rich investing in the stock market. Right. Warm button. Or, or, or a couple of lucky people. Right. But it's sort of like the world we live in, the media, social media. Yeah. They just show us all those successes. And you think, oh, my God, I'm an idiot. Of course, I need to be buying X or whatever. Right. Yeah. And again, then did they really buy it? Is, is the other story to this? Yeah. Uh, and I'm but, sorry to interject, but, but, but you're going to go bananas on this. So, um, you know, so 
people aren't doing this. And a lot of reason for this is that a lot of people don't have good models or they haven't been taught this. We've, we've railed about the lack of financial literacy in school. So then we get to the point of what are people being guided to today, right? And the role of social media is huge, especially in younger people's lives. And the quality of information that is available on a lot of these platforms. And I say this as a guy who's running a YouTube channel, yeah. right? Um, the, the, let's put it this way, generously. There's a lot of variation in the quality. That's a polite way to say there's a lot of crap out there. And uh, Amy Nixon, um, who has been on this program before, she's Texas runner on Twitter. Um, she just posted a TikTok video of this, you know, 20 something year old bro who's hanging out in a pool. And he's talking about this great way to make money that, uh, you know, every, every, entrepreneur knows, but the average person doesn't. And I'm going to give you the skinny here. And he basically says, all right, look here, these credit cards, I created a business. I took out, uh, I used these credit cards that I opened in the name of the business to buy this Rolex, which is worth a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to sell it back to a jeweler for $80,000. I'm going to get my cash out that way. And then I'm going to declare bankruptcy. And that debt gets written off. And boy, isn't this easy? And isn't this the way to go? Right. Like they're getting types of, of advice like that. Right. So um a huge yeah, part, as you've said many oft times, is just, you know, get yourself educated in the right way to do things. Yeah. And look, this is the thing I have to go through with my kids all the time because they see those same stupid videos and they say, Dad, what about this? Right. Dad, what about this? I'm like, first of all, how does that guy make money? Right. Did he really go buy a Rolex? And it's probably a fake Rolex. Uh, one. Did he really go do this? Right. Two. But no, I mean, they're doing this stuff to get views. And if they get enough views, then they can get monetized by TikTok or YouTube right. or, or sponsor or whatever. Yeah. Sponsor, whatever. And that's how they're making money. You know, there's an old saying if you want to be a millionaire, write a book on how to be a millionaire and sell a million, a million copies for a dollar. Yeah. Right. You'll be a millionaire. And people will buy the book because everybody wants to know how to be a millionaire. Right. So, I could write a book and sell it and I can make a bunch of money. And then I'm going, I'm driving around in my Lamborghini, living in a big house and saying, yeah, you know, my investing works great. No, I really just sold a book for a couple of million bucks. And, you know, there you go. So it's always important to, to understand, you know, how people made their money. I, I mentioned Warren Buffett a second ago. Warren Buffett did not get rich investing, right? Now, I know you're, now don't argue with me, just listen. What Warren Buffett did is he started a business and then got other people to invest in the business. Then he invested that money from other investors into other companies. And he built this conglomerate empire that made him billions of dollars. Uh, Ray Dalio, uh, you know, hedge fund manager, $160 billion hedge fund. He's worth billions. He didn't get rich investing. He got rich investing other people's money and getting paid for that, right? That was his business. Invest, you know, people that build investing businesses make money on the backs of investing other people's money. And look, everybody gets wealthier, right? The people that invest the money get wealthy. The, you know, the business owner gets wealthy. Everybody gets wealthy. So it's fine. There's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But there's very few individuals that go, oh, yeah, I started out with a dollar and I invested it into cryptocurrency and I made millions and I didn't lose it all, right? I sold it at the top. That happens, right? There are people out there that did that. The vast majority of people don't. And the vast majority the of people, overwhelmingly vast majority of people don't. Let's be real over, yeah, exactly. And all these people you see on the internet telling you how to get rich quick. I mean, there's a thousand schemes out there, right? Just get Chat GPT to write a book for you and sell it on Amazon. You know, do drop shipping. If it, look, if I had a business that I was doing that was making me millions of dollars, why the hell would I share it with you? <laughs> Right, because competition is going to lower my margins. If I have a if I have a business drop shipping something and, and I figured out the niche and I'm I'm making a killing with it, why would I why would I get on the internet and then get you to subscribe to my channel to get you to pay me to teach you how to do what I'm doing? Why would I want to dilute my business? That makes no sense whatsoever. This is you know people ask me all the time. It's like, well, Lance, how do you do your business? That's my business. I'm not going to tell you how we do things because that's our secret sauce that right. look and all look full disclosure we're portfolio managers we get paid to manage people's money financial planning those type of things that's our business i am selling you a product right now i want you to come invest with me i would love for you to come give me all your money and i'm going to charge you a fee 
right? If, if I wasn't promoting something, if I wasn't providing a product, I wouldn't be spending an hour and a half on Friday. I got better things to do on a Friday than hang out with this you. So, you know, <laughs> I like Adam and that's why we do it. But no, let me just be serious. I'm marketing to you right now and, and full disclosure, right? I have, a, I don't need your money. I don't need you as a client. I have plenty of clients. My business is, my business is very successful. We've been building it for years. I, I do this because I enjoy spending time with Adam. I enjoy sharing knowledge with you. I hope you find usefulness in this. I hope you can take something that we say home and build and help you build better wealth for yourself. That would make me very happy. But don't mistake that I'm here, you know, not marketing to you because I am, right? You know, the, the articles that I write on our website, go to realinvestmentadvice.com, read our articles, read our newsletter. I'm marketing to you. I'm, I'm showing you I know what I, I'm doing. I show you that I have experience and I hope that you will find value in that and you would like to become a client at some point. But if not, that's completely okay. But on the internet, when you look at people, and, and this is what gets me about a, specifically about what you're talking about, is that I'm highly regulated, right? The SEC, I've got to, re, you know, I've got to maintain records of every piece of, of advertisement I do, every piece of marketing I do. And at any moment, the SEC can walk in my door and say, hey, I need to see all these records, right? And if and you said you did this, I need to see the record that said you did whatever you said you did, right? Right. And, and your downside regular. for bad action is very high. Exactly. But because I'm regulated. Right. But all these other people are out here on the internet with no, no education, no degrees, no financial experience whatsoever, telling you to buy or sell this, and they have no risk of... If you lose all your money, there's no recourse on them. They have no risk to you. I have fiduciary risk to every one of my clients. And I have a responsibility to every one of my clients to protect their assets. These people on the internet don't. So the first thing when you listen to somebody on the internet say, what's their risk, right? What is it that they know that I don't know? And are they really telling me something that is valid? And nine times out of 10, that answer is going to be no. Yeah. Um, so God, great topic. I didn't really think we'd hit this vein. I'm going to probably have to push some stuff off to next week as a result, but um, super important. And, and, and to that end, I mean, there are a lot of people out there um, who, you know, we, we, we get painted with a brush of, oh, you guys are too bearish, right? And, and I, I like to think that we are literally just looking at the data and, and revealing our best interpretation of it and that of our experts, right? But there are definitely people out there that I, I do see as fear merchants where, um, you know, I either look at their work or, or perhaps even know some of them and just say, you know what, like they are just saying this to sell a newsletter or whatever the, the product is. Right. Um, and so you have to be very, very cognizant of the source and how they make their money. When I, I totally agree with that. And the, the guy, the example I use, the TikTok guy with the Rolex, you follow his advice, you go to jail. <laughs> I mean, I mean <laughs> exactly. It's, it's it's not just like uninformed advice. It's like really dangerous advice, right? He's 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 having you try to commit bankruptcy fraud, right? Which they there are laws and protections against. So and there's, um, and there's a lot. There's I'm seeing a lot of videos right now. Um, you know, on a whole, you know, just create a business and then lease a car and then put it in this other business and do. It. You're gonna you're gonna be audited by the IRS to the end of time. If you don't wind up in jail, I mean, there are certain people in this country who get away with tax fraud, but most people can't. So, you know, be again, just because somebody on the internet tells you that you can do this, you better understand what you're doing before you start doing some of these complex schemes because you are going to get audited by the IRS. Well, and that's why I tell people to, to every week to work with a professional financial advisor. And I'd, I'd expand that to say for anything, look, if you want to talk to a professional lawyer about some of these decisions too, like, great, go ahead. Like my whole point is, is like validate, right? And whether you work with Lance and his team or the guys at New Harbor or somebody else, I don't care as long as they're good and they're held to a professional standard so that you can feel confident that the advice you're getting is being filtered through, you know, an appropriate level of expertise, Right. So anyways, folks, be careful. Who was it said, don't believe everything you read on the internet? That was Abe Lincoln, right? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, exactly. Or is uh, Pete, uh, Barnum and Bailey, one of the two. I don't know. <laughs> Pete Barnum. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, we're running out of time here. Um, yeah. First, let's get to your trades. Did you make any trades over the past week? Uh, none this week, um, you know, because we, we were kind of already set up going into this week for a bit of a contraction. Um, we had we, we've kind of picked up recently a little bit of, of more conservative exposure. 
we did kind of shift, and we talked about this last week, we shifted the duration of our bond portfolio a bit, but uh, this week we just kind of sat still and just, just kind of letting the market sort itself out a bit. Um, you know, we've talked about for the past couple of weeks about seeing this rotation in the market from, you know, tech and discretionary into some of these other sectors. And we did see some of that happen this week. We, we still haven't come, we, we still have more rotation to go. There's still this, this kind of pushing bias on tech and discretionary, but we are starting to see a little bit of a pickup in some other sectors. And that's what you said earlier, you know, we're starting to see this market kind of broaden out a little bit and that's that rotation into some other sectors. And so, um, this week, we didn't really need to make any changes. I think we're pretty well positioned. We're still underweight equity. We're still overweight cash. But, you know, we need a, we need more of a correction. We're still on a buy signal right now. The markets have started uh, a couple of months ago. Markets are very extended We need uh, and still overbought. So we still need a bit more of a correction. And, and again, I wouldn't be surprised to see this kind of correction or kind of continue next week. Now, importantly, a correction doesn't mean the stock price decline. A correction can also be the market just trading sideways. Like we saw, you know, earlier this year, we went 45 days, we went nowhere, yeah. and then the market took off running. So we can go through these corrective phases where markets just go sideways and those moving averages catch up to the market. And that's okay. That's a good entry point if we get to that point. So over the next 30 to 60 days, we're either going to have a price correction or a consolidation that allows for a better entry if you want to add exposure. Okay, great. And folks, just a reminder, we'll have Lance back on this program yeah. every week, or at least every week that doesn't have something better to do, apparently. <laughs> Not going to be apparently. You, isn't you, are the, you are the only thing I look forward to every week. So there you go. <laughs> right, thanks. Uh, I'm going to make that clip the teaser for this video just so there you go. Absolutely. Better. You should do that. Um, uh, but anyways, we'll have Lance, we'll have Lance on here, folks, to tell us, you know, every week where we are in that progression. Um, all right. Well, look, as we wrap up here, um, I did want to spend some time. Uh, talking about some of the lessons that I learned through this, you know, crash course in in the healthcare system with with my mom's um, illness and then passing, um, we probably don't have enough time here to do it uh, justice. And I, I don't want to give it short shrift. It's a really important topic, I think, for a lot of people. Um, just a couple of quick things. So, Lance, I think we sort of floated this idea like a month or so ago about, hey, you know, should we do a webinar on planning for you know, aging parents and how to fund our own, you know, healthcare needs later in life and whatnot. Um, we did get a fair amount of interest in the comment section. So uh, if you don't mind, now that I'm kind of re-emerging from that whole crisis, um, I'd love to work with your team on getting a date for that, that we can communicate to folks. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, would you mind, uh, I'm out of the office today, I'm here with you, um, and I'm out office all day tomorrow. Would you shoot me an email and I'll take care of that for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, just a couple of quick highlights of sort of what we'll be talking about. Um, you know, what I, what I did learn is uh, the medical system really is designed to like take all your money from you, right? I mean, it's, 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 it has a lot of flaws. Um, in my mother's case, she was, you know, an example of, of somebody who didn't do a fantastic job of, of planning her later life and and ended up in a position where she didn't have a lot of assets or income, in fact, very little. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of things that weren't great about that in her last bunch of years. But from a medical standpoint, it was amazing to me, even before this past couple of weeks, the medical care that she could get for not having any resources. She qualified for a ton of healthcare services, but also like you know, senior living resources, uh, you know, subsidized food programs, um, uh, you know, she got older and, and more infirm, uh, qualifying for in-home care, folks who could come in and do things in your house a couple of days a week and whatnot. It's amazing how much is out there, um, particularly for, for people who, who are below a certain socioeconomic level. Um, the challenge is, is that finding out what they are is really hard. <laughs> like, you have to have a quarterback in this game to really play the strategy well or really find out what's out there. The challenge is, is that you may have to be that quarterback a, a lot, that, that, that there aren't a lot of experts out there who just say, hey, I have all the answers come here. I've got a really well laid out you know, guidebook for you. You have to be out there kind of piecing all this together. There are some experts who can give you substantial chunks of the puzzle. And if you can find them, they're amazing. But I wanted to flag this for folks because I think a lot of folks watching here are going to go through this themselves or have loved ones that are going to go through it. And I want to, I want to, you know, had we been able to plan out 
what we had to kind of scramble through in these past couple of weeks and months. Uh, if I could have planned that out a few years in advance, it would have gone way better for everybody. And so that's what I'm sort of trying to help people here with is to maybe help them get this stuff, you know, laid out beforehand so that as they or their loved ones, you know, start really needing these services, it, it's a it's a gentle process and not a mad dash. Um, some other great things that I'll I'll talk about later on uh, in depth when we talk about this. Um, so let me just end on on kind of a good note here, which is you know my mom didn't have a lot of resources um, financially or materially. Um, she did have a lot of friends and a lot of community, and I, I just want to say from just having been in the mix here, folks, uh, at the end when when you know your time is up, uh, the only things that matter our relationships, um, the quality of your relationships. And, you know, did you feel like your life had meaning? It's it's really your memories and in, in, in your relationships. I'm happy to say my mother, I think, died a very rich woman in on, on those elements. Um, and the passing was pretty amazing, which again, I'll describe when we have more time. Um, very sad event, obviously, but, but it really couldn't be more grateful for how her passing went in terms of... Uh, we thought we were going to lose her really quickly. We ended up having several days of her kind of recovering and being like completely with it consciously and having phenomenal conversations and a lot of laughs. And she said all her goodbyes that she wanted to. And importantly, I was able to extract answers to a ton of questions that we hadn't had the chance to ask her before, um, both like logistically um, and as well as just like, what do you want to have happen after you die? Right. And that type of stuff. So, um, and then she ended up gently passing away in her sleep um, as her, you know, breathing got got less and less efficient, but just a super peaceful passing. So first off, I want to say thanks to everybody who'd been checking in and let them know that that my mom had a really gentle exit from the world, which is wonderful. But um, but in this process, one of the things that was kind of tearing me uh, in different directions was my older daughter was graduating college. And uh, I had to, at one point, leave my mom in the hospital to go to my da daughter's graduation, which was really hard, but my mother was insistent. We, you know, sort of celebrate the, the key life milestones. And uh, the college, uh, or the graduation, you know, professor who was giving the convocation or whatever, um, had this great comment where he said, hey, uh, the electrons in the atoms of our bodies were forged in the, or, or were sprung into existence with the Big Bang. Right, they've been around since the beginning of the universe. The the neutrons uh, that give us mass, uh, they were forged in the supernovas, you know, over the the billions of years since then. Um, and through whatever process, you know, science, fate, evolution, God, whatever you want to say, uh, we as humans have have emerged. Right, we're this this conscious species that, as Carl Sagan put it gives the university an opportunity to understand itself, right? We're, we're conscious of how the universe works. We're trying to understand our, its rules. In many ways, we are the creation of the universe that, that finally is able to understand how the universe operates. So, so when you sort of think of that arc, like the gift of human life is so incredibly rare and priceless, right? And so what matters is what you do with that gift. Now he was, you know, talking about it with my daughter, but of course I was seeing the the other end of that journey, which is my mom kind of evaluating her gift at the end of her life and in large ways, you know, certainly relationally, you know, very happy with how she had spent it. So that's kind of my parting advice to people here, which is yes, we talk about money a lot on this channel, right? But it's really a means towards wealth and 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 you know, the wealth that really matters in the world isn't the financial stuff. It's not the material trappings, right? It's, it's, it's what persists at the end, which is the relationships, the meaning, the memories, et cetera. So hopefully if you take anything away from today's uh, video here, it's maybe a little bit more of an appreciation and a focus for how to spend your time going forward, which is yes, focus on the money stuff. It'll be an important enabler, but really spend your time on the things that matter most, which largely is investing in your relationships and spending your hours on things that you think give your life purpose and meaning so that when you reflect and all you have are the memories, you feel good about it when your your time comes to leave. So I'll end on that, Lance. Anything else you wanna no, throw into that uh, mix before we wrap it up? No, uh, th no there's there's nothing I can say that, that would add to that conversation. That, that, you know, it's, it's a great point. But I, you know, as we talk more about this in the future, and yes, we'll get 
there's so many things that are available to help people. You know, a lot of people complain about the healthcare system, like, oh, healthcare is so expensive. Yeah, we also have the best healthcare in the world, bar none. And there's so many programs to take advantage of to make healthcare affordable, but you just have to do the work. And as and, and unfortunately, like you said, just most people don't know about these programs. They're available, and there's just so many of them out there. And there's so many opportunities to get assistance where you need it. When my father passed, I went through the same thing as you. And you know, going through that whole process of you know paying you know hospital costs and care costs and all the hospice costs. You know, there's so much financial support out there for that to reduce the burden of the cost on the family. You just, but again, you got to know where to look. And so we'll, we'll certainly do a sim, a, a, you know, a session on this and try to help people, you know, figure out how to start planning for these type of things. Good. Yeah. So totally agree. And, and I will say, look, I'm from a family of, of doctors and healthcare workers. There's a lot of valid criticism to be slung uh, at, at the U S healthcare system, but I got to say, I mean, the amount of the quality of the care that, uh, that, that, my mother just got going through this as so somebody with no assets was unbelievable. And and maybe that's part of the problem. And maybe we're, we're spending too much money at the end of life for really old people. But I will tell you from a data point of one, you know, our family uh, was just incredibly grateful for all of that. And I will say too, ICU workers, hospice workers, Lance, those people are freaking saints. Well, they are. Um, they, 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 are they, don't, they don't do it for the money. Let me tell you. They don't. And the fact that they can come in day after day and treat people like royalty and see in many ways, you know, some really horrible parts uh, of, of human existence and uh, and still be so positive and, and not let it crush them. It's just I, I don't know how they do that, but thank God that they're doing it. All right. Uh, so to wrap things up, folks, um, just a reminder, as I said, I was going to do. We always encourage people to um, work under the, the guidance of a professional financial advisor and trying to navigate all of the issues that Lance and I talked about here. If you've got a good one who has created a personalized portfolio plan for you and is executing it for you while keeping you well-informed, fantastic. You should stick with them. But if you don't have one of those or you'd like to, a second opinion from one who does, perhaps even Lance and his team there at Real Investment Advice, uh, then consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the advisors at Wealthion endorses. To do that, just fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Set up a consultation with these guys. Again, they're totally free. There's no commitment to work with them. Uh, it's just a um, public service that these guys offer to help as many people as possible make decisions prudently now in advance of what might be coming. Um, and with that, if you enjoy these uh, these uh, uh, weekly market recaps that Lance and I do that increasingly just kind of spiral off into the big questions of human existence at the end of them. Uh, do us a favor and show your support by hitting the like button and then clicking the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks so much for being with me on this journey again this week. I uh, really do value these talks. Even if nobody watched, it's uh, my favorite hour and a half of the week. Mine too. And we'll do it again next week. All right, everyone else, thanks so much for watching.